we have been carefully working our way through the book of Philippians, and I was looking for someone who's not shy in front of people who would do our scripture reading for us, and I seem to have found someone who is not camera shy. <laughs> Uh, if you want to open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3 and read along with us, it'll be on the screen behind us as uh, we do our scripture reading. I want you to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. This is God's precious word. Thank you, Chris. Amen. What a, a amazing passage of scripture. When, uh, when I was a younger preacher, <laughs> back in my day when I was a young wee man, I used to try and weave this scripture into like just about every sermon. I would just be like, such a, a, a powerful and important scripture. I, I literally would try and weave this into uh, every other sermon if I could get away with it. But I see three main points that I wanted us to focus on that we see in the scripture. First and foremost, and this recaps where we were last week, is getting to know Christ. As a believer, it is one of the highest privileges that we get to know him. Secondly, there is a goal for us to strive towards. We've got something, there's a finish line that we are, we are booking it towards together as believers. And third, we are to hold fast to what we've already attained. And motocross, motorbikes, I know some of you uh, uh, have got that in there. So uh, you'll see how that will tie into the message. I just didn't just pick fun pictures for fun pictures sake. There's actually a reason that there's motocross bikes in this message today. So as we begin in uh, verse 10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the sharing in his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain to the resurrection for the dead. That's where we ended last week's message. But it ties so closely into the thought of what Paul is about to walk us through. I, we would be derelict if we didn't carefully say, how does this piece of scripture tie into the future message that we're, we're moving into? Getting to know Christ. It is both a joy and it is, it is a labor of something that we get to do, something that we are to do. We get to know him in power. Now, some of you might think, what do you mean by that? I mean, Jesus performed many miracles and, and commissioned the apostles to do the same. They did likewise. They did more miracles in number than Jesus did in his ministry. But we get to know him in power. We do not serve a lifeless idol that can't do anything for us. We serve a living God who is powerful and active. And we can choose to be plugged into that and to be engaged in what God wants in power, or we can choose to leave our life unplugged. Have you ever had one of those iPhone cables that uh, has been plugged in and unplugged and plugged in and unplugged so many times and, and bent so many different ways that it refuses to charge your device? Have you guys got a cable like that? Go home and throw that cable away. Throw that, throw that cable away. When it comes to being plugged into Jesus, uh, go right to the source. Be plugged into him and don't let anything mess with your connection to him. We get to identify with him in his resurrected life right now. You don't have to wait till you die in order to experience the resurrected life of Christ. We are to know him in power and in resurrection. We will get to know him in our sufferings. I know that this, this past week, has been a very challenging week for some of us. I say for some of us, I know that um, this is the first full week after uh, the memorial for our precious, precious Cheryl. Uh, we also, uh, one of the, our families did a memorial for, for his mom and dad. And I know that there are several of us in the fellowship that are going through really, really hard times. And sufferings produce in us a maturity that no other circumstance produces. Suffering, when we are a believer, does a good work in us if we will lean in and learn what, what God wants us to hear in our suffering, and that is we get to become like him. 
the greatest privilege for all of eternity is getting to become like Jesus. We get to be like him. And getting to that day where our resurrected body will forever be with him and serve him, that is a small snapshot of what it looks like getting to know him. And as I was praying about this part of the message, God brought my heart to John chapter 10. John 10, 27 through 27, 27 through 28 says this to us. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. These are Jesus' words. No one can snatch you out of his hand. Oftentimes in Israel, uh, many shepherds would let all of their sheep graze together in the grass. And you might think, well, that's a, a nightmare. How do, you, how do you get the sheep? How do you separate the sheep? Because you, when you look at one sheep or another sheep or a bunch of different types of sheep, you're like, how, how on earth would you make sure that you came away with the right number of sheep? It's very simple. If you've ever seen it, the shepherd just calls. He calls to his sheep. The sheep recognize his voice and the sheep come. When, when the shepherd calls, the sheep come. He calls to them and they come. Have you heard the voice of the Lord? And are you listening carefully for it when he calls to you that you may come to him? It also gives us, uh, John chapter 10, this certainty that no circumstance, no demon, no power, nothing will snatch us out of the hand of the great shepherd if we are in the hand of the great shepherd. There is no better place to be than carefully shepherded by Jesus. Verse 12 says, Not that I have already attained, obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has lay, laid hold of me. And I think uh, the reason I've got a runner on this slide is he's giving us a picture of pressing on. How many of you have ever been in a running race, like a foot race? Some of you? None of you? Oh, come on. A couple of you have done it? Um, I did a, a little bit of track in high school, uh, but, but back then I was, I was much thinner. <clears throat> and uh, had asthma uh, until I was 16 years old. I struggled with asthma, and at 16, the Lord cured me of asthma. He just took it in one day. But up until that point, being a thin, asthmatic American in South Africa, like, the guys would almost lap me. Like, it was so bad on, on, the, on the track. I would be running the 400, which was not my race, and the guys would be finishing. There would be no one left on the track, and I would be like... <gasps> to the booze of all the whole stand. So you might ask yourself, why run? Like, why would you put yourself through? Like, I, I ran so hard that day. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I, I, I gave it every ounce of strength. I ran till I almost puked. I, I hobbled off the field and almost puked, and I was dead last. The answer is, I wasn't running for the stands. I wasn't running for, for, for people to give me the applause. I was running because our team needed someone to fill the spot, and if you don't fill the spot, you don't get the single point for putting a runner on the race. I had one reason and one, one purpose for doing it, and I accomplished that purpose. I got us that one point. Never placed, but to say, know who you're running for. This world is going to boo you. When you're going to stand up for the truth and say, say hard things in love, the world's going to go, oh, boo! Remember who you're running for. You're running for Jesus. You're not running for me. You're not running for your family. You're running for him. And so if you keep him in mind and, and pleasing him in mind, you'll hit the finish line. As I was preparing this message, I was reminded, uh, if any of you are familiar with YouTube and if you look at the, the algorithms, if you look up, uh, uh, didn't get to the finish line, there are, there are so many videos who are winning the race and don't end up winning. Uh, our goal together is to press on. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it. One thing I, that I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward for what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. I spent some time uh, looking at videos this week and, and one of the ones that was just so sad, there was, it was a, a, a women's race, and the, the finish line is a white stripe that you've got to cross. You cross that white stripe, 
you've got it, you're first place. And this woman who had pushed and pushed and pushed, and, and she was just ahead of the pack. And she crossed the white line, and she slowed down, and she stopped, and she was like, hands behind her head so she could breathe. <gasps> Not realizing that it was a white stripe in the road, and the finish line was just over there. And second place runs right past her, and second place takes the win, and she gets silver or bronze, I can't remember for her specifically. But there are so many moments like that that are fun that you can watch on YouTube. I thought I would share one of them. Maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't. Guys, go ahead and put the volume up on this one. Strike three. This is a championship game. The ump called Danny strike three. Wins it. Look at the second baseman. The second baseman knows something's oh, wrong. He's running up front. He's looking for the ball. Where's the ball? I'm not sure what's going on here. So is this the way it's going to end? Wow. Keeping your eye on the finish line. So 6.4 million people watch that, so I'm assuming some of you have already seen that. It is the Horn Hornell Pal Mac game. It's a championship game. These two teams have, have pushed the entire season to get to this place, and Hornell believes they've won it because the pitch throws, and, and I had to actually look this up. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. Any of you confused with that? Some of you confused? So it's a third pitch, and it's a strike. The umpire calls it as a strike, but he, the, the catcher drops the ball. And with a dropped ball on a third, on a, it's a, there are already two outs. He would have been the third out. He drops the ball. In order to complete the play, he has to tag the batter or throw it to first. He just has to do one of those two things. If he tags the batter or throws to first, game's over, Hornell wins. He forgets to do those things. He drops the ball, which means technically he's stealing first base, which almost never... Who, who steals first base? No one. This kid. This kid books it, and he runs. And the, the Horn Hornell is all caught up in celebrating. They're clapping each other on the back. The, the catcher thinks about tagging him, but doesn't actually tag him, and then puts the ball in his back pocket and starts jumping with his friends while the opposing team wins because they've got two runners on base, and those two runners circle round. The game is over. Hornell loses. It's so tragic, and it's a... We can sometimes take our eyes off of the prize. Just like this group, just like this group, celebrating early, taking our eyes off of the prize. And so Paul here is encouraging us in the same way as if you're, if you're getting ready for a marathon, your, your prize, your finish point is finishing that marathon. Not, you don't stop until you've broken the tape. You go all the way to the end. And that is what Paul is encouraging us to do. He's saying, don't stop. Press on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Now, you might be confused as to what is Paul here in Philippians telling us the prize is? What is Paul saying? This is what you need to keep your eyes on. The heavenly call that we have in Christ Jesus. That is the prize. And that's exactly why Missy raised her hand because she knows. If you look down in your passage, keeping your eyes on the heavenly call that we have in Christ Jesus, that is our finish line. Don't stop short of that line. Keep pressing on. Uh, if, you, if you look, again, if you look on YouTube, I, I saw hours and hours and hours of different uh, Olympians and, and champions and people that, that uh, uh, the, the biking one was, was such a heartbreak. Again, they were doing, uh, it was a, a race, a motocross race, and they're doing the jumps and they're going around the track and the gal who was in first place, who's got a solid win, she's way ahead of the other guys. She's on one of the final jumps. She jumps up into the air and instead of focusing on finishing the race, she takes her hand off, off of the, the thing, like which never do. And she's like, yeah, she's, she's trying to work up the crowd. She's like getting excited. The finish line is in sight. Her hand is in the air. Her bike comes down. And because she doesn't have both hands on the handlebars, slides. <sighs> and it gives, gives her opposition one, two, and three, just enough time to pass her. She doesn't even place top three. She had a solid gold if she had just kept her eyes on the prize and not done any showboating, but that last jump. And so for us, that encouragement is 
forgetting what is behind. And that means the ways of the world that used to belong to us. Forgetting all of that, setting that aside, not letting that trip you up, putting your past behind you and saying, Jesus, I am all in. That is what we are to press towards. We are to forget the past. I, again, I was thinking about all the different metaphors. When, when you're swimming a mile, when you're, when you're riding a horse, when you're on the motocross, whatever race it is you are in, if you stop and take your attention off of what's most important, you will lose. My boys at one stage watched um, the movie Planes. Have you seen the movie Planes, the animated movie? They watched it, oh, there was maybe two, three month span where that's all they watched. They watched nothing else, just that, over and over and over and over again. Spoiler alert. The end of the movie, the guy who's just about to win, the plane who is like the best of all the planes, he's just about to win, except instead of going through the finish line, he turns on his side so that he can get a picture. He wants, he wants a really good picture, so he has a plane, he turns and smiles for the camera right as Dusty zips past him and takes the gold. Don't be guilty of taking your eyes off of the prize. Let those of us then who are mature think this way. I like how Paul puts it. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we've already attained. Now, let those of us who are mature, I like um, the word here in the Greek talking about not, not becoming perfect, but setting perfection as your goal. None of us are perfect yet, but we are maturing and slowly becoming more and more like Jesus. If we had said yes to him, each day we get to be more and more like him. He says, we will think the same way. And he's referring to forgetting the past, leaving worldly things and sins behind, and straining ahead for the heavenly call that we have in Christ Jesus. That is what we are to do. He says, you will think this way. He says, but if you don't think this way, God will make it clear to you. I, I just, I love that. He's not, I'm not going to argue you into it. I'm not going to arm wrestle you into it. I'm not going to try and, and trick you into maturity. He's saying, if you disagree on any point, I trust that God will turn your heart the way that he wants it. So let us think this way. Only let us hold fast. Let us not let go of what we've already attained. The maturity that we already have in Christ, don't lose that. Each and every day we are to continue to be matured in the process of becoming like him. And so if I was to ask, if I was to go around the room and we were to take an hour and I was to ask every person, what does Christian maturity look like? I would probably have 30, 40, 50 different answers. And as I was, as I was going through, different authors have different opinions of what is a mature believer and who qualifies to be a mature believer. I love Eugene Peterson, who went on to be with the Lord in 2019, said this. He said, following Jesus doesn't get us where we want to go. It gets us where Jesus goes. The mature believer says, I'm going to lay my aspirations down and I'm going to go where Jesus goes. What Jesus calls me to do, I will do. I am who he says I am. And so, I, again, I was trying to think maturity itself is such, such a deep and important issue for us to think about what are some of the ideas of maturity that we could, we could process together and think, how do we get from where we are to being mature? And I think it starts with who I am. If you don't know who you are in Christ, you can't yet be mature in him. Settling that question is one of the first questions that every believer has to, to answer that. Who am I? And answering that question leads us down the path of maturity. Learning humility over pride. Someone that is filled with pride and always out for their own interests and building themselves up and making themselves look good and focused on what they want and what will actualize their thinking and their life is not spiritually mature. People who are spiritually mature are humble. The third thing that I would say is service and gifts. These three things, who I am, humility over pride, service and gifts, these are the things that, that create in us a mature dynamic of a believer who says yes to the Lord and no to the world. Ephesians 4, speaking of maturity, says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect a mature body of him 
who is the head, that is Christ. A mature believer says, my goal in life is to be like him and to serve like him and to walk like him, speaking the truth, which sometimes the truth can be painful. Sometimes the truth hurts. Speaking the truth in love is how we grow in maturity in all of these things. And so there's a personal dimension of maturity that's important that we are to grow in. There is an attitude and an emotional dimension in which we need to, to grow in. And then there's a spiritual dimension of maturity. It, maturity is not just one thing. It is three separate things. If I was to give you a picture of these things, I would say the head, the heart, the hands. Maturity is not one of these things. Maturity is all of these things. Growing in your intellect, growing in your person, growing in, your, in who you are in Christ uh, in, your, in your mind is, is essential. Turning over your heart and your emotions and not being ruled by your emotions, but being ruled by the Holy Spirit, turning over the heart of who you are to Him and not being blown by every wind that comes through town is a part of becoming a mature believer. Growing in service and in your spiritual gifts. You have been gifted by Holy Spirit with specific gifts that He wants to use in His kingdom. Are you using them? Are you activated in them? Or just like we talked about that, that iPhone charger that today when you go home and see it, I want you to throw it away. Are you unplugged from the spiritual giftings that the Lord wants to use in your life? Are you being fruitful in what he has called you to do? Are you serving where God has called you to serve? And sometimes that's amazing things he's called you to do. He's like, this person, I want you to witness to them. I want you to bring them to me. Because he could, he could call any one of us to do that. Or he might say, I want to go do a load of laundry. And you're like, oh, laundry? I hate laundry. Exactly. Exactly that. That's what, part of how I want you to serve me is in all things. And sometimes we think of bringing someone to Christ as, as oh, and serving my family as oh. We do. We think of it that way sometimes. We're like, uh, but all of these things are to be done for him and by him and through him. Service to him touches every part of our life. If you think about these three things as parts of the same circle, are you a rounded, mature believer or are you a little lopsided? When I was a young man and I was 18 and I was in the very first serving capacity uh, at a vineyard church in South Africa, I had a lot of spiritual maturity. I had a lot of spiritual understanding. I, I knew what my gifts were and I knew how to use them at 18. I knew this. I had a good sense of who I was in Christ, but emotionally I was very, very, very immature. And so I was a lopsided balloon. I, I knew my giftings and I knew who I was in Christ, but there was, that, there was a part of me, of my emotions, of my heart, that I wanted to control and didn't want God to have control of. And, and it, was, it was awful. Think about um, a wheel, because we're using the idea of a circle. It has to have a perfect roundness in order to be any good at all. If, if your wheel is two-thirds round and one-third flat, how well are you going to drive when you're driving down the road? Thunk, 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 thunk. And if you had to think today, in your own life, in your own maturity, where is your head, your heart, and your hands? Are you maturing in each of these areas? Or just like I was, are you stunted in one of these areas? Is there an area where you need to bring it before the throne of grace and say, Jesus, help me to mature and to be like you? Because maturity is the, is, should be the goal of every believer. And maturity says, I'm willing to sacrifice now for the end goal of what God wants. Uh, if you've ever watched, uh, there's a, a famous psychological experiment <clears throat> where they take a bunch of kids and they, they put a chocolate chip cookie right in front of each of the kids. And they say, don't eat that chocolate chip cookie. If you don't eat the chocolate chip cookie now, later when I come back, you can have two cookies. I will give you two cookies. If you eat that one right now, then that's all you get. And then they walk away. And then they keep the cameras on the kids, and then they leave for 20, 30 minutes. So it's interesting to see some of the kids are like, well, I'll touch the cookie. Some of the kids are like, well, if they're not here in the room, maybe I'll lick the cookie. Blah, 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 blah. But I won't eat the cookie. And, then, and some kids are like, no, it's not, it's not worth waiting. Oh, blah, 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 cookie monster it, right? 
No, I'm serious. And then some kids are willing to sacrifice the cookie right now, knowing that in the future they'll have double. That's the mature outlook of saying, I'm willing to sacrifice in the here and now, knowing that the end goal in my life for Christ is something more beautiful than I could imagine. I think, uh, I didn't even put this in my message, but marriage is a little bit like that also. To say, there is a, a sacrifice that happens in marriage. I'm saying no to every other possibility and yes to one woman. It's a beautiful thing of what you're setting aside and what you're committing to for, for life. It is a sacrifice, but one that is so worth, worth taking. Are you mature in Christ? I want to go ahead and invite the band up as we look again at these three things that the Holy Spirit wants to challenge each of us with. Get to know Him. Get to know every part of Him. And if you're confused at all about how to do that, grab one of the... Uh, you, you know who's, who's around and who uh, walks with the Lord and, and, and having been around us a little bit, you should see. Be like, ask them, what is it you do in your walk with the Lord? How do you get to know the Lord Jesus? Ask the different guys, the different gals, and uh, uh, follow along with what, uh, what Scripture encourages. Strive for the goal. Don't forget where the finish line is. And don't stop short of the finish line. Keep pushing forward. And hold fast to the maturity that we already have, to those things that we already understand. Keep doing those things. Our band is already here, and so we're going to pray, and we're going to do a worship song, and then something that we get to do once a month, we're going to partake in communion. We're going to do it a little differently. Uh, so uh, if you'll worship with us, and uh, then we'll do communion together. We have victory in his name. And so at the end of our service, I pray that you will come to know Christ. I pray that you will come to know the power of his resurrection, that you will come to know by sharing in his sufferings, by becoming like him in his death. I pray that you will reach the righteous resurrection from the dead. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday. And enjoy your 4th of July. Take care, guys. Bye.